Thanks. I just wanted to make me wonder what Paul thinks about everybody else in the game. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to talk about fire and why it can make a difference to healthier outcomes and why I think it should. So uh, fire, fire, which is fast healthcare interoperable resources, it just shows how hard it is to come up with a globally unique acronym these days. Fire is both a technical specification and a community. So if you work in healthcare, you, guys, you know that even if you're providing the world's best healthcare, you're dealing with broken processes all the time. Um, and, and I have any number of examples from my personal life. Um, a friend of mine who had a circulation problem in his leg, specialist sent him off for an, extra, for a, some, an imaging. He got the imaging done. He said he was going to sit there and wait till they gave him his paper report so he could take it back to the specialist. They said, we're not going to report it today, don't wait. We'll send it to your specialist. Next week he goes back to his specialist. His specialist says, oh, I haven't got that. Come back, you can see me again. He's like, that's three months' time. I can't wait that. That's when I can get a new appointment. I can't wait. Actually, the specialist had the report, I know, because I know how the distribution works, but his software didn't actually pick it up correctly, and so he hadn't found it. Well, that's typical. Um, we've seen other industries transformed in the last decade, and IT has enabled the transformation. IT didn't do the transformation, but it enabled the transformation. But it's not happening in healthcare. Um, and, and, and IT, one of the reasons is because IT is not enabling. So you can't. <clears throat> and I set out to say, I want to solve that problem. I had decades of experience in healthcare and in healthcare IT and in healthcare IT standards. And I was frustrated by where we were. So we designed a standard that was, we felt fit for now. So it'd be interesting because this is all standards, nerdy stuff. We wanted something based on web technology. We wanted to use an open license. We wanted to focus on simple definitions in as much as there is such a thing in healthcare. We want to be pragmatic around what people are actually doing rather than trying to impose dogma on them. We want it to be cheap to implement and implement as much as possible. And we wanted it to be suitable for use both in business to business back end systems and in consumer to business exchanges, mobile phones and social media and so forth. And, and the thing about that list is that list is all very much IT focused, although it's not actually IT, it's IM, information management. And, and I think I often remind people and I remind myself, Although we loosely say IT, this is not a technology problem at all. It's an information management problem. But but this was all about healthcare. It's, a, it's about taking the web and, and applying that blowtorch of the web to healthcare because my belief is that healthcare needs that. So we've ended up now with FIRE, which is really the web for healthcare. It's an open community based around web uh, technologies, web techniques and web philosophy, um, totally open participation. I loosely say that there's maybe somewhere between 100 and 10,000 participants in the fire community depending how you count, but we don't. We don't count because counting means you'd know who is part of it and there's no like official registration, you're just part of it. And it's led by HL7, which is a standards organisation deeply connected around the world. And the community, the basic model is we pay to argue, and we all argue with each other, and then we produce a paper trail of what was left when we stopped arguing, because not enough people disagreed with it anymore, and we publish that and call that the standard. It's the uh, agreements that everybody's gotten sick of arguing about. <clears throat> Um, and, and yes, I'm very much full of argument. Um, and, and so we publish an open standard. So it, it describes how to exchange healthcare information using the web, the web techniques, web technologies, web methods, and, and it's publicly available at hl7.org slash fire, and it has deep continuity across the healthcare system and, and the existing standards. And then, and having done that, when we built on that idea, and it's the the building on the idea. Standards standards are like startups. 
90% of them fail. And they didn't fail because someone went into the standards going, this is a bad idea, let's do this. Just like startups, right? It turns out it's really hard to know whether things are a good idea. But, but what happened with us is we had a passionate community that grew around the idea that built tools and demonstrations and community and web presence. And, and we took some stuff into production and showed that it worked. We stabilized governance. And then we were selected by Argonaut, which is the US EHR vendors, as their preferred method of operation. Apple picked us up. That was a pretty big deal business-wise, even though Apple's use is technically not surprising. Um, from a business point of view, that was a huge thing for us. And, and so we just had rapid growth in community. And it's the community that takes a formal published standard and makes it a real working standard. So I want to talk about our goals. <clears throat> My goals are threefold. To disrupt healthcare IT standards, to disrupt healthcare IT, and to disrupt healthcare. So I'm going to talk about each of those. But I want to be really clear, it's not about commercial outcomes. Most people, when they talk about disruption, they mean billion dollar companies. I don't care about that level of disruption. What happens, happens. I care about microprocess disruption. I want to change the process of healthcare. Whether that means that the incumbents get better or they get, I don't care. It doesn't matter. What I'm interested in is healthcare, not the healthcare business. I didn't mention business on here. I just want to be clear about that. A lot of people get very focused on the business outcomes. So overall progress, some of you will be familiar with this, is Gartner Technology Adoption Curve. Some technology is introduced, everyone gets wildly excited about it and makes unrealistic, gets unrealistic expectations for what can be achieved. Then it turns out that actually the problems remain the hard problems and the technology doesn't solve the people problems, which is what we really have. And so then everybody gets deeply disillusioned with the new standard because it stinking didn't solve our problems. And But eventually it turns out it does have a use and it, it moves into a plateau of productivity. And, and people often ask me, where are we on this, fire? where is fire on this curve? And, and I had the good fortune to sit down with the original developer of this work uh, late last year and to go through his formal criteria. And at the time, we were clearly headed towards the trough of disillusionment, which is, should I be happy that we're getting to that or should I be sad? I don't, I don't know. Um, it seems inevitable and, and in fact by his criteria, um, particularly in terms of EHR adoption in the USA, we're now hopefully in the trough of disillusionment itself, which is where it turns out that you can have a technology and you can, everybody can rah, rah, rah about it and tell you that they've done it, but then it turns out that actually getting it to happen, that's hard work. <clears throat> so I'm talking about the three legs of the journey that we're on. The first leg of the journey is you develop a platform standard. These are the standards that create capabilities that people can use and, and that's our business in fire. But then you need to find a particular use and say, okay, the standard creates capabilities but we have to agree which bits we're going to use this problem, how we're going to structure it in a, a deployment because there's no we can't do that at the platform level. There's too much variability in the system. So we adapt to a particular community of use. Um, OpenHIE is one example of doing that. I, IAG, Argonaut, there's heaps of examples. Um, and then <clears throat> you take that specific community agreement about how particular problems are going to be solved and you drive those into production and it's driving them into production where the hard problems are. The interesting thing from my point of view is we've got no leverage at that last step to get vendors to put capabilities in their systems and then to get institutions to go, we'll actually do the work to configure them and make them useful. Um, <clears throat> so this is old stats now. I don't know what the current stats are, but, but um, for instance, with FHIR, 80% of uh, institutions in USA are running software that is certified to provide um, patient portal um, capability. 100% of institutions are required to provide that service. 
Last I heard, 4% were, even though 80% could and 100% are required to, 4% actually are. <clears throat> so that just illustrates how hard it is to, to do the last leg. <clears throat> so in terms of disrupting healthcare IT standards, for me, this is in the bag. This is done. We set out to do this and it's done. The, the healthcare IT standards community as a whole, not all parts of it yet, but as a whole, are have or are moving to open source and open process or accept that that's inevitable. Uh, they are focusing on moving to agile systems to be able to much more quickly respond to market requirements and market feedback. They are all having much more focus on the later legs of the process that I just talked about. And, and we've reduced the ability of those organisations, one of which is my own, the one I work for, to, re to extract rent from the market. And they're kind of dealing with that very painful process for them. Um, basically, all the organisations are hang on by, hanging on by the skin of their teeth, which I put to you as a value proposition for everybody else, not for them. <laughs> but, but the upshot of what we've been doing fundamentally is economic. We are driving down the cost of data integration. And, and I set out to reduce it by 90%. And people laughed and said, there's no way. But actually, when it comes to patients getting hold of their data, we drove it down by more than 95%. And if you really want, I'm going to talk about that later. <clears throat> so, so the fact that we, the way a community works, the technology works, the uh, way that integration happens, we drove down a whole bunch of fundamental cost factors. Um, people came to me and said, well, that'll, that'll actually, um, that'll drive down the amount of money people spend on interoperability. But in practice, it works the other way. They had a certain amount of budget allocated to interoperability. They started getting more business benefits from the same amount of budget. So they said, actually, we'll spend more money on interoperability and get more business benefits. That, that's how it actually works in practice. It's playing out that way. Um, so if I was being adopted all over the place, but I don't need to talk about that here. This is, this is to go back to structure, this is what we used to have on the left. We, we would ship systems that consisted of a database and a bunch of services and servers and applications, all within a clean garden wall where we owned all of the parts and they were all administered and run by the same dev team and then we would the, uh, on request for a great deal of cost, add specific integrations, which are the black diamonds, around the perimeter of our system to do specific data exchanges. And, and we, <coughs> they were always costly and hard to maintain, and they were never enough. And, and so what we're working towards now is a different model where the uh, data integration points are standards-based, which in my case, the standard of interest is fire, but it doesn't really matter that it's fire or not, but they're standards based. And that runs through the whole system and the, all the parts of the system interact with the persistent store using the standards. And so the system is interoperable as a foundational property <coughs> rather than something added on afterwards. And, and that's the transition that we're pushing everybody towards to actually design systems that are interoperable as, at their core. So, so what that means is that we empower applications to offer more functionality at less cost, both internally in their architecture and in terms of fitting into the ecosystem. And, and we're driving implementations towards interoperability as a core, which is what I just showed. And that means that you can use the cloud and the web technology and framework changes and, and the the AWS stack or whatever stack is of interest to allow much more modular software and best of breed in practice. Rather than having best of breed meaning sets of silos, best of breed no longer need, means silos. And, and, and so we're in the process of driving that change. It's not in the bag, but if you look around the industry, you can clearly see all of these trends. So we tipped up the playing field and everyone's sliding this way. It's taking time. <clears throat> I just want to comment about one more thing that we're doing. Something that a lot of people don't understand about open source. Open source is the worst solution you can get. 
I heard that from Seth Godin at an Eclipse conference take a decade ago. When he said that to me, I'm like, there's no way, there's no way, it's, not, it's wrong. But how can you sell something worse than free? Right? If someone's giving something away, how can you sell something that's not that good? So open source is the floor of the market. And as open source improves, vendors selling gear, selling software, they fall off or they get better. So if you provide open source, you're actually pushing the market up. All right, and we do a lot of open source, we've driven a lot of open source development, and we're gradually floating the market up. And that's a way that we can manipulate all the commercial vendors. They're looking at the open source software going, ah. And, and that is part of the way we're disrupting healthcare IT. Of course, that's happening here too, which is part of that community work. Now, turning more to health here, I, I always show this when I present, because I think People don't really understand this well enough. It should be something that we emotionally understand. When talking about changing a clinical process, as we start on the left with a clinical process that we're running with, which has a set of adverse events that happen, morbidity, mortality, and, and we want to drive that down. So we change a clinical process. Typically, we standardize it. Quite often, we throw some sort of IT system added as part of that standardization and and we reduce the number of adverse events and and there's some so there's some the blue which we don't touch we didn't touch them in this process but then there's the ones that we got rid of we got rid of a bunch of adverse events and then <clears throat> then there's the ones we introduce and every time we make a clinical change this process happens usually we standardize something my favourite example of this was where I live in Melbourne, Australia. Um, the dispatch of the ambulances, the way it worked was you would call an ambulance, uh, an, an emergency service operator, they would gather all the details that they could from you and then they'd write down a very abbreviated summary on a post-it note and stick a post-it note on the wall that corresponded logically to your physical location. And then the dispatchers would work off the post-it notes on the wall to dispatch the ambulances to the actual call. Well, that process as Melbourne grew and as the ambulance services grew more sophisticated and the emergency presentations grew more challenging, that was not scaling. They couldn't manage that process anymore. So, so they invested in an IT solution. They created a database, they moved everything to the database, they actually shadowed everything in the database, so they still ran the old system. They created an expert system that prioritised and they honed and honed and honed the expert system to the point that they were ready to go into production. They introduced it within a week. Their turnaround times, their morbidity and the mortality were all down. Tremendous success. But in the media, it played out as a total disaster. Because the expert system, if it under-prioritised an emergency case, it consistently under-prioritised it. Errors were now systematic. Errors were very rare, but when they happened, they were catastrophic. And so what appeared in the media was a few anecdata about individuals who died who wouldn't have died under the old system because they were not prioritised. Some guy waited 17 hours for an ambulance. And they're like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, but the system was not making that happen. They, they were way better off, but they were getting hounded in the media because the errors that were happening now were systematic. Anytime you change your clinical process, you've got to be ready for that. It will happen. I mean, you can change it in the other direction too and get rid of some systematic errors and have more adverse events. But the point is, nobody cares about the thousands of people who are not dying today that were dying yesterday, but they care about the one person who died because of commission rather than omission. So you to be prepared for that change to happen. And the same applies when you do interoperability. Every single information system I've ever seen has degeneracy built into the system. People know how the system doesn't quite work. When you interoperate two data silos with their own degeneracies, you permutate the degeneracies to people who don't know about the degeneracy. And suddenly everyone's freaking out or having clinical safety events because the degeneracies are not well known. So it's interoperability is always the case of this. Be prepared, it will happen. And yet hardly anybody does. Right? So, so I want us to understand this emotionally because it's a big deal. If we're going to disrupt health, we better understand this process. <clears throat> so 
our focus now is turning more to healthcare rather than healthcare IT. <coughs> I'm going to start with uh, the classic definition of interoperability used by HL7 and others is an old long-standing IT definition, the ability of two or more systems or components to exchange information and to use the information that's been exchanged. We use it how? We've been doing this for decades. We haven't achieved anything in healthcare or much in healthcare. I've got a definition I prefer which is structurally the same, the ability of two or more clinical teams to exchange patients and provide seamless care. Um, people have said, oh, you could come up with much better definitions. You probably could, but I wanted to follow the structure of the old definition. We need to start thinking in terms of clinical interoperability. It's a clinical problem. It's a human problem and a record keeping problem. It's not a technology problem. And we should just stop talking about technology. We now have an information management Work keep, workflow, work record keeping problem. <clears throat> For me, our focus is to empower patients. We want to bring the patient and particularly the primary carer into the information framework surrounding the patient. We have this bizarre situation where the focus of the problem has no access to information about the problem or little or restricted access and, and an even more bizarre situation that particularly with chronic disease, somebody is acting as a primary carer and they're not, the primary carer is not part of the care, the care framework. This, it doesn't make any sense. Um, there are specific projects and specific cases where that's not the case, but generally speaking, that is the case. And that's the case anywhere I go in the world. Everywhere I go in the world, people are obsessed with how broken their healthcare system is. They're obsessed with the fact that the way they pay for it is the problem, but the problems at the process level are the same everywhere. The outcomes are weighted differently depending on culture, but the problems are the same. It's not about how you fund the, the system. <coughs> I meant to say that earlier. But most patients merely getting the data, the patient, their data, getting them into the information framework won't make any difference. There's a few, a very small number of patients who have diagnosis problems, who desperately need all the information they can get. And they're very high profile when they're in that case, but it's actually a very small number of patients that have, that don't have a good diagnosis. Most of us have an obvious diagnosis, trouble dealing with the diagnosis. And it's not information that changes, it's services that change lives, but you can't provide the services till the patients have the data. But a common frustration of patients, and, and I see this all the time with patients, is as they bounce around the clinical system engaging with primary care practitioners, specialists, community practice, they get conflicting advice, conflicting care plans. Instead of, you know, like, so, my mother-in-law went to the, G, the primary care practitioner. He said, refer to a specialist. The specialist put her on a medication. She went back to the primary care practitioner. He said, no, you shouldn't be taking that. He doesn't understand. But how's a patient supposed to manage that? That's ridiculous. We don't need to do that anymore. We can actually have a care plan and that, that the care team can collaborate on electronically. We have the IT support for this in fire now. So that instead of actually saying, telling the patient to, to not to follow the advice of another doctor, you say, oh, I'll actually, like a GitHub change proposal, I can change, propose a change in the plan and we can talk to each other directly. <clears throat> so, so we have services like that in production in the world, but it's a big clinical change. So that's where we get to disrupting health care. So I set out to, I say we set out to remove IT as a barrier to seamless care. I want to be really clear. There's lots of other barriers. There's lots of other problems. We, we don't solve those other problems. We just solve the IT problem. But, but my goal is that by providing, solving the IT problems along with the wider societal changes around IT, that we'll tilt the playing field and everyone will start sliding towards better seamless care. Um, we want to allow for AI to be deployed at scale because AI is 
just about as good as the average clinician under operational pressure. Not the best clinicians in the best conditions, but the real conditions in the real conditions. That's where we are at today. How are we going to let AI change the system to improve it? Um, to me, what we need to do now is to enable clinical champions to bring all those parts together and demonstrate improved outcomes from changing processes so that we can then set about changing culture and expectations. And, and, and so when I said we set out to disrupt healthcare IT standards, that's done, it's in the bag. We set out to disrupt healthcare IT, that's changing, it's not complete yet. We want to disrupt healthcare, that has not started yet. That's increasingly our focus. The ride forward is going to be very, very bumpy as people disintermediate clinical processes, healthcare funding arrangements, um, start eroding the effectiveness of the cross subsidization that's ubiquitous in healthcare. It's going to be a bumpy ride. We want to improve healthcare. Um, it's going to be a challenge, and there'll be plenty of regulatory capture holding us back. Finally, I want to say fire is an infrastructure enabler, but it's not a solution to things of our own. But our fundamental model is that we hold a community treasure that, that everybody owns. And because everybody owns it, everybody is richer. That's our fundamental model. And that is a really solid model when it comes to knowledge about how to improve healthcare. You need good, strong governance and an open community process that builds trust. Once you have that, big companies come and donate their best people and their best IP to fire to the fire community. And they don't do that out of the goodness of their heart. They do that because they want themselves to get richer and they get richer if everybody's getting richer. And that same model can be reproduced in communities of use in domains, in cascading sequences of how to make healthcare better. And, and so what I encourage everybody is to come and join us in that process. Join us in creating public treasure. You could choose to join our community, but, but choose to join some community. And, and if you want to join ours, that's the links where you can come and find where we hang out. Thank you very much, and I hopefully we'll have time for a couple of questions. <clears throat> So any, any questions? So what are some of the biggest blocks you've seen in adoption from health institutions? Well, I mean, there's obvious blocks like um, uh, the big picture economic stuff. Like for an institution, why would I share data with the patients? It'll just make it easier for the patients to go to some other institution. I mean, and, and vendors used to think that way, but they've moved now to say there's a business to be there's a business improvement to be made here. We get better. And, and when hospitals start seeing that they can actually do a better business because they can um, share their work more effectively, then we'll start making progress. So there's cultural change there. There's huge liability legal blocks. For instance, say in 18 months' time, it's more efficient, effective instead of visiting your GP to go to your AI, upload your clinical record, tell it what the problem is, it'll do the first round diagnosis, it'll do the first round prescribing, um, uh, asking for diagnostic services, and then you get referred to an actual person, right? How do you think the GPs are going to react to that? Um, actually, I think in the long run they'll be way better off, but their funding model is destroyed by that model. And so there's that it's that stages of interlocking arrangements that run the current system and, and the interdependency of change. And, and then you get back to classic change management problems. And, and then is that safe? So brings me back to here, right? The first thing everyone's going to say is it's not safe, right? Because we can point to some bad outcomes, but we need to point to the good outcomes as well. So that that requires, for me, building a much better cater of knowledge about how to understand um, safety consequences and efficiency consequences from system changes. And we are not good at system changes in healthcare. So increasingly, I think that's where the action is going to be. <clears throat> now, any other questions? 
Have you seen any surprising, <clears throat> surprising wins from this effort? Um, in terms of actual healthcare outcomes, I'm going to tell you about a system that was prototyped and I believe went into production in Amsterdam. There's some particularly Dutchness about this system, but when you are described, when you are diagnosed with a mental illness, you get referred to a psychologist. The psychologist creates you a care plan. It's a, stored as a fire care plan, but at that point it stops mattering about fire. And the care plan is available to you and to your GP and to your psychologists and psychiatrists and to the emergency department and to the police and to the courts. And, and then any of them can look at that and say, including you, you can look at it and say, I don't think the plan's working. We need to change a change proposal to the plan. And <clears throat> a lot of people say, the cops, the courts, are you kidding? That's terrible. But I mean, when they pick you up in the middle of the night having a meltdown, what do you want them to, have to do? To throw you in jail or to do something else? So actually, if you can have a trust environment like that, it works really well. And, and of course, they can opt out of some of those sharing, but but I tell you, I have a mental illness in patient living with us. Her life would be so much better if we had that system running in Australia. It would be way better. Um, and and so for me, that that system happened so quickly it was a few years ago now. That was it was you know for me that's a big win, and I'd love to see that model. I mean, it has to be different in different places in the details, but I'd love to see that general model of, you know, managed care plans rolled out on scale because it, it would be just as good for me or for my mother-in-law or my wife or, you know, all of us to be able to say we have a managed care plan and our care team coordinates with each other about our care plan rather than just giving us conflicting instructions.